and let's get started with details of our evening's adventures. So tonight we're joined by Tom Walker, the author of The Wanderer and Alaska Wolf's Final Journey. And he is going to talk to us about Wolf 258, who traveled more than 2,700 miles in less than six months through Alaska. There are a few quick housekeeping items. Participants are going to be muted for the duration of the program to help assure everyone has the best listening experience. And we will try to field questions during the Q&A. So feel free to type questions in and then I'll save them up at the end and we will answer them at the Q&A portion. If for any reason you missed part, uh, any part of tonight's program or wanna listen again, we are recording and we'll send you the recording in a follow-up email. So with that, I'm so excited to introduce Tom Walker. He's been a rodeo hand, horse packer in the Sierra Nevada, Alaska wildlife conservation technician, pilot, wilderness guide, log home builder, and documentary film advisor. He's a photographer and a writer, and he's the author of more than a dozen books centered on Alaska, including Wild Shots, Alaska Wildlife, and The 70 Mile Kid. His work has been featured in all kinds of magazines, and he's been living in Alaska for more than five decades in a log cabin near Denali National Park. So thanks so much for being here with us tonight, Tom, and I am gonna pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Hillary. Uh, welcome everybody from the perimeter of Denali National Park. Today, it's an overcast day, cold. We've had a very cold spring. We just had snow about a week ago, and today it's uh, warmed up a little bit. Today, I'm gonna talk to you about a very interesting wolf that I found its story a few years ago uh, that was uh, radio collared in Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve up in the northeast corner of Alaska. And I'm happy to share that story with you today in a slideshow and also in my book, The Wanderer. So if you stand by a second, I'm gonna share the screen here. and begin as soon as we get to the beginning of the slideshow. All right, when uh, Wolf 258 um, came into being, he was part of a radio collaring uh, project in Yukon, River, Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve in Northeast Alaska. It's a region uh, a unit of the National Park Service and the National Park Service has responsibility for a, a huge amount of land in Alaska. And this is one of their premier areas that's visited very lightly. If you're not familiar with it, Yukon Charlie Rivers is over in the Northeast side of Alaska on the Yukon border. Fairbanks is to the West, Anchorage is to the Southwest. Uh, for those who, of you who may not know, uh, much of Alaska is roadless very lightly developed. Most of the villages are native villages and there is very little infrastructure in Alaska in the northern portion of Alaska, except for one road that goes from Prudhoe Bay down the Fairbanks. <clears throat> Alaska has unlimited wild land, but this area of Northeast Alaska is the wildest of the wild. There's wild, scenic rivers, there are two national wildlife refuges and wildlife beyond compare. When I first heard of Wolf 258, a friend of mine, John Birch, a biologist <clears throat> who is responsible for this study, uh, told me about this amazing wolf that had gone a long, long distance. And eventually I received the location points data points for his movements. And it was somewhat daunting to see all of these uh, movement points around uh, Northeast Alaska. I could make very little sense of it because some of it, especially these points down here over Yukon Charlie and up here on the coast overlay points over points over points. And it was very confusing. So what I did was I took out took out the dates and some of the information and just left the, the points on the map. And then looking at it, I thought, I, I want to tell the story of this amazing movement of this animal. And, and it's going to be daunting. 
and how am I going to do this? And the first thing I recognized is because I've been up here almost 50 years and have spent most of my time outdoors chasing around the country and animals, I realized that a lot of this country it traversed, it had traversed, I had camped in, floated rivers in, hiked on, uh, flown over, fished, or hunted there. Uh, and even some of the areas in Canada that the wolf moved into, I've been to some of those places. So I knew that with the, that information, that background, with that familiarity with the country, I would be able to tell the story like nobody else. Maybe someone from New York could tell the story, but they would not know what uh, or where the wolf had gone. So beginning about six years ago, I got all of the weather data from the Canadians, the Yukon area, and the North. I got the weather data from Alaska. I laid that over these points. I got the data for the movements of the porcupine caribou herd and the central Arctic caribou herd and put it all together to try to make sense of the movements. And this was a map the Park Service made for me to show uh, the location of the wolf's movement in relation to uh, villages, uh, some dates, some locations, and uh, its relationship to the Alaska Yukon border. If you've not been uh, in Yukon Charlie, and as I said, there haven't been many people visit there, it's lightly visited. Uh, the country is rolling hills. It's never been really glaciated. It's not like the Eastern Alaska Range or the Central Alaska Range, which are very jagged, steep mountains with a lot of glaciers. The, the mountain, the peaks here are, are tundra covered. This area produces a number of caribou. Uh, it's the calving grounds for the 40 mile caribou herd, and it produces a lot of caribou. This map provided by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game shows the summer calving range of the 40 mile herd, essentially in the very heart of Yukon Charlie Matt Rivers National Preserve. So it's very important uh, calving area, natal grounds, because these animals migrate quite a distance and they go up north of Fairbanks and cross and down into Canada a little bit. And so the, the interaction of wolves with caribou is very important to a lot of Alaskans. On the, in the secluded lands along the river in the riparian and riparian areas, uh, moose are abundant and they produce young, which uh, later grow into animals that are quite uh, prized by subsistence and sport hunters in Alaska. A lot of people uh, hunt moose for meat and for trophies. Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve, like a lot, but like other preserves in Alaska, has some unique features. Although it's managed by the National Park Service, there is hunting and trapping, subsistence hunting and trapping, trapping allowed within the boundaries of Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve. The preserve itself has a rich history because it's on the Yukon Highway, which served as a high, a major Yukon River, which served as a major highway for people coming and going in Alaska and into the Yukon, specifically after the 1898 gold rush in Yukon territory. Uh, this cabin is located at the mouth of the Nation River, which I'll mention later. Uh, it was the cabin of a trapper by the name of Phonograph Nelson. And he lived there uh, in trapped in the 20s, 1920s. And he was found frozen to death in his cabin. Another historic site along the river from that era is Slavin's Roadhouse. You may have heard of the Yukon Quest dog sled race. This is a checkpoint on the race. And the Yukon River uh, has been a roadway, a highway for dog mushers, river boats, travelers of all stripe. It's big, it's powerful. 
but as it flows through Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve, it moves fairly slowly. This is a wide spot in the river that I'll mention again a little bit later, but this is uh, below a, a hillside, which is called Biederman Bluff. Biederman Bluff is a thousand feet above the river. So you get an essence of the width of the river here being three quarters of a mile. And over here is the mouth of the Kandik River, which leads into the Ogilvy Mountains and into Canada. <clears throat> the fall comes very quickly. Uh, our summers are very, very short. Fall begins almost the middle of August. And by the first week in September, most of the fall colors are gone and the river quickly freezes up. This is a very, very difficult time for wolves. The, these animals uh, have gone largely hungry most of the summer. Their best luck at hunting large prey species comes in winter. So late fall or late summer, early fall and early winter are difficult times for wolves, especially a lone wolf. A single wolf, has a great deal of difficulty uh, bringing down a large prey animal like a moose or a caribou. They can bring down adult caribou, but moose are very formidable and it takes a pack to bring down a, a, wolf, a moose. And consequently, a lone wolf has less chance of survival through the winter than does a pack because a pack has that advantage of attacking from multiple directions. And so a lone wolf is at greater risk of um, malnutrition as it goes through the winter. In Alaska, there's this controversy, probably similar to the Rocky Mountains, where uh, hunters uh, that value moose and caribou see wolves as competitors. And there has been since, Alaska was a territory, a lot of trapping and hunting of wolves. And at one time there was uh, organized governmental control of wolves, uh, both by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and then by the state of Alaska. Uh, the common way that wolves were killed uh, and even into statehood was aerial gunnery. Uh, this is a, a famous, Alaskan pilot who had mounted four shotguns on his airplane and he would fly over the tundra and shoot wolves from the air like a fighter pilot. His uh, weapons are on display at the Talkeetna Historical Society Museum. And of course he killed a lot of wolves. In uh, modern era, trapping still goes on even in the, in the preserve. It's uh, for some people, it's sport, for, for some people, it's subsistence, but trapping and snaring are the main wolves, main way wolves are controlled in Alaska and Yukon territory. <clears throat> because the caribou and moose are so important to people, the National Park Service back in 1993 started a, a wolf study in Yukon Charlie. And at this point, it's the third longest running wolf study in the world. And it involved tracking wolves and putting satellite radio collars on two individuals, the breeding pair of each pack to see how they uh, um, led their lives, how they interacted with their other wolves and also their effect on prey species. We call these gray wolves, but Here's an example of uh, a colored wolf still under anesthesia. They vary in color from black to white. You can see the uh, um, beauty of Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve in this photo, as well as the beauty of the animal. Bridget Borg on the left kneeling and John Birch, biologist on the right kneeling studying a wolf with their uh, uh, chase pilots. One helicopter uh, would carry the person using the dart gun and a fixed wing plane would track the wolf and alert the helicopter to where the wolves were. 
This is what a wolf looks like with the collar. Uh, when a, a wolf's neck ruff is at its peak length, it would hide the collar. Uh, they s seem to have no uh, ill effect from the collar, but they do um, at times shed the collar uh, and, and then the, the cover is recovered by the biologist. <clears throat> um, in um, November of 2010, uh, Wolf 258 was running with another wolf, Wolf 227, a female, and they were running through a territory that had been Wolf 227's for uh, a year after the rest of her pack had been decimated by injuries, trapping, or hunting, and she was the last wolf in the Edwards Creek pack. And she uh, died in the fall of 2010. And so Wolf 258 roamed that territory by himself. And then in the spring, on the last day of May, he crossed the Yukon River during breakup. This is what the river looks like. It's going by at nine miles an hour in some way or other crossed that river. And he went up Biederman Bluff, climbed a thousand feet up Biederman Bluff and then dropped into the Kandik River and headed for the Yukon Territory. A lone wolf going off on its own is referred to as a disperser. And many wolves two to three years old leave their packs and go in search of their own territories and their own mates. Because as most of you likely know, wolves uh, in a pack are controlled by the breeding pair and they are usually the ones, the only ones that breed. And so when wolves reach two to three years of age, <clears throat> they go off on their own to find their own territories and their own breeding partner. A disperser has a couple of uh, handicaps. As we all know, wolves have incredible sense of smell, vision, hearing, and then vocalizations. Their howling is one way they communicate besides uh, what they see, what they hear, and what they smell. But a wolf that goes off on its own faces incredible threat from other wolves. The famous wolf researcher, Dr. David Meech, said that wolves die of one of two ways. They either starve to death or they're killed by other wolves. And when a lone wolf enters another wolf's pack, another pack's territory, it's at great risk of being attacked. So it has to move somewhat stealthily. But you can see the paradox. It's trying to find a mate. So how is it going to find a mate if it has to be quiet? It can't just howl because if it howls all of the time, other wolves that may not uh, be anything but antagonistic would respond and go to that howl. And at the same time, a wolf that relies upon its scent uh, for locating other animals and learning about the other uh, creatures in the area can't come to a scent post and mark it like it would in its own territory because again, that would alert the resident packs to its presence and put it at great risk. And so as Wolf 258 moved north throughout this journey, he was constantly having to weigh in some way, I don't know how he did that, but weigh the, the uh, uh, need to make contact with other wolves but also make sure he wasn't attracting uh, antagonists. Because what will happen if a wolf runs into another pack in their territory is those wolves may likely attack it and kill it. How wolves, lone wolves, come together and pair up and become a breeding pair in a new area is still a mystery, how they no, there is no threat from another wolf. How they find one another is still somewhat of a mystery. That, of course, they're always hunting, 
So their, their ability to find one another might be just circumstantial, but it, it is still, I don't think anyone ever, you know, of all the research that's been done with wolves, has ever seen two unrelated wolves come together and form a pair bond. And they found them afterwards, they followed them beforehand. How it actually happens is still largely a mystery. So as Wolf uh, 258, which we call the wanderer once, once he left his home territory, crossed the Yukon River on the 1st of May, he went north into the uh, Yukon territory, headed towards a place called Fishing Branch Provincial Park. And this is a very unique area with limestone caves and caverns, water percolates down underground and bubbles back up late into the winter. And uh, the latest salmon run in all the far north occurs here as those fishes return to those warm waters. And there's large numbers of grizzly bears and, and wolves fishing there. And if he would have continued in that direction, he would have ended up in Fishing Branch, but instead he turned and, and it re-entered Alaska and went north. The one time I was at Fishing Branch, uh, I won't even begin to try to pronounce that name, the First Nations name of it. Um, there, it was very warm. It was only like minus 10 Fahrenheit. And we saw no bears because it was too warm, but there was this black wolf fishing and it was amazing to watch a wolf catch salmon, and he was very adept at catching salmon. As he went north, he went through uh, following uh, a drainage called the Colleen River, which is in Alaska. And the Colleen River in Alaska, which runs through the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, south out of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, is paralleled in Canada by the Firth River. And these two rivers are the major corridors for the spring migration of the porcupine caribou herd, over 200,000 animals. On the Firth, it was frozen, but yet snow was fairly thin, a typical spring, May. And, but in Alaska on the Colleen, this is the Firth a uh, little later in the spring, but on the, the Colleen, uh, which parallels another river, the Shinjek, that both roll out of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It was full of snow, still winter, and the caribou were, instead of following their usual routes up to the north side of the Brooks Range in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, moved uh, east into the Canadian side of the uh, caribou calving grounds. and. Uh, this, the wolf at one time, the, the Colleen would be to uh, the right in this picture, and the wolf was up on these ridges right here. And it's interesting because at this point, uh, Lobo Lake was over in this area, and that is where Margaret Murray and Olaf Murray made a pact between themselves back in the 50s to uh, establish, to work to establish the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And they were some of the founders of the uh, uh, Wilderness uh, Preservation Act. In Alaska, this uh, was typical uh, conditions. And you can see from this why the wolf was veering and the caribou were veering over into Canada where there was less snow and less frozen ground. And caribou migrate long distances. Uh, some members of the porcupine caribou herd have been clocked at moving 3,000 miles in a year, and the longest migration of any terrestrial mammal. And as they went north, winter came. Uh, in and out, the, the typical spring weather is a mix of one day sun, one day cold, one day snow, one day rain, another day of sun, and they began to have their calves. And calving was occurring in the in the Yukon side of the boundary, 
uh, and you could see um, the stragglers moving north. And in some places when they were still in Alaska, they were hampered by very deep snow. And the wolf was following like a week behind the movement of the caribou herd. This is the Brooks Range. Arctic National Wildlife's coastal plain is here. This portion of the Yukon Territory is a national park, uh, a Vavik National Park, and this is Buntuk National Park. Both of these national parks were established by the Canadian government in cooperation with the First Nations people for the protection of the porcupine caribou herd. When the wanderer passed through the Brooks Range, he crossed over onto the Firth River. And as far as this north point was almost on the Arctic coast. He could see it, he could smell it. He was in the land of the polar bear. And it was just astounding to think that a wolf could move that far and into that country. But then he did a fairly astounding thing. The caribou were moving in this direction, coming up from the southeast and then from the southwest this way, instead of going up the Colleen like this, they were going more towards the east. They were all going this way. He went through the herds and headed southeast. Why? I'm not sure, but for some reason he went this way. And this was his farthest east, east point almost to the mouth of the Mackenzie River. Then in the next few days, he retraced his steps and was back in the caribou herd at the peak of calving. And those calves, those 15 pound calves are extremely vulnerable to wolves. Uh, they're the ideal size for a wolf to catch and feast on. But then again, another inexplicable move he moved out of Avavik and went back into Alaska. This was his farthest east point. This is uh, Skull Ridge in uh, Yukon Territory near the mouth of the uh, uh, Mackenzie River. And, and why he was at great risk here was because the Blow River Pack is oftentimes the largest wolf pack in Canada, or I mean in Northern Canada. And, and here he was in their territory, but yet he was able to survive and move on. Uh, the Canadian government has a lot of, uh, Parks Canada has a lot of uh, remote cameras set up in various places. And at the time the wanderer was over in that country, we don't think this was him because he's with another wolf, but this was a, a, a remote shot of two wolves interacting with the grizzly bear. So he moved back into Alaska and normally in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge this time of year, he would run into large numbers of caribou. This is their prime calving grounds in Alaska. But this year, because of the deep snow, the, the caribou were not let, let there like they normally would be. And again, in their calving grounds, uh, very susceptible to wolf predation. One of the other principal predators of, of caribou calves is uh, grizzly bears. Uh, grizzly bears can catch caribou calves quite easily until the calves are about 10 days old. Once they're 10 days old or older, they can outrun a grizzly bear. And calves are susceptible to wolves to a great degree until they're about 14 days old, and then they begin to be able to fend for themselves and escape uh, wolf uh, predation. Lot, lots of snow on the east side, uh, on the, excuse me, the west side. One of the, the animals that the uh, wolf may have been feeding upon would have been rock ptarmigan. And once the snow went off, the ptarmigan were on their nest and they were a lot harder to find. But this vast, beautiful country called Arctic National Wildlife Refuge had no caribou when the, when the wanderer came through. The trails that had been eked out across the tundra for decades and eons were barren. 
The one animal he did run into and probably saw many of uh, were Arctic foxes. Arctic foxes are uh, deathly afraid of wolves and wolves will kill foxes as they can catch them. But this little animal pre presents a very significant risk to a wolf because Arctic foxes are the reservoir of rabies in Northern and Western Alaska. And uh, there have been instances of rabid wolves attacking people in this very region that the wolf was traversing. And luckily in both instances, the, the two people were armed and they were able to, to protect themselves. But they did in the aftermath find four or five other wolves that were infected with and dead from rabies. So this was a risk that the, the uh, wanderer was facing. He was feeding on some of the same prey species that foxes feed on, Arctic ground squirrel is one. And wolves are very adept at catching squirrels. They dig them right out of the ground like a bear does. And I've watched them catch these squirrels, and sometimes it seems they're even better at getting squirrels than the bears are. And these are his movements as he went east. In just two or three days, because of the lack of caribou, he exited the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This is the Canning River, which is the, east, the western boundary of the refuge. And he settled into this area parallel, uh, 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 excuse me, just east of the Dalton Highway and parallel to the Sagavan Rictok River. And then he made some excursions throughout the summer back into the refuge, but this was the area he settled in. And so it led John Birch to believe that he possibly had found a mate. One of the reasons he would be there would be because he'd found a mate. Uh, the downside to that theory was that uh, there was likely a lot of caribou um, that had calved in this area because this is, this is uh, the calving grounds of the central Arctic herd. And this is where a lot of calving goes on. So he may have settled there because of the abundance of prey animals. The other prey species he probably encountered while he was there were muskox. And in this time, at this time of year, muskox are having their calves and these little calves are just the perfect size for a wolf to bring down, except that muskox are very formidable animals and they have a, a defensive strategy that has evolved because of wolves and that's a single line of adults protecting a calf or a circle that protects calves. And it's well known that a pack of wolves can uh, disrupt these circles or lines and get the adults running. And once the adults are running, they'll be able to catch a calf, but a lone wolf does not have that uh, best chance to catch a calf. This is the land of the midnight sun. When everything greens up. And I've, I've followed much of the the wanderer's progress in this journey he took just to ground check and ground, ground truth, the movements and what had survived from maps and uh, scientific information. And this was a shot I took in the area where he spent part of the summer. And what I came away with at looking at this is the immensity of the landscape, how big it is and how difficult it would be for a predator to find its prey on this kind of a landscape. And it's a very difficult landscape. Uh, it's wet, it's underlain by permafrost, there's tussocks, there's a dense brush in places. And when the uh, wolf was finally um, um, studied, physically studied, we found evidence of injury to his body that likely occurred while he traversed these lowlands and in the mountains. One of the interesting things about the theory that he may have found a partner is there are very few wolves on the North Slope. And 
probably the reason why is because there's never been a den found on the Arctic plain. They, they, there have been no dens, and there's probably two reasons for that. One of which is because of the permafrost and the chance that the, any den would fill with water. And the other one is that there's only prey species to support wolves for maybe two or three months a year. And the rest of the time, uh, there isn't much to, to live off of for a wolf, except for small animals. Most of the dens, most of the wolves that come out on the coast come out on the coast because from, from the mountains, there's dens in the mountains. They come out on the coast during calving time, but that time of year, they stay in the mountains with their pups that they bring food to. Fall comes very early on the North Slope, very early. As, as soon as the middle of August, fall colors are, are rampant, beginning to peak in some areas, and winter is close at hand. The caribou begin their migration in south, to the south side of the range. Even the caribou cannot stay on the North Slope during the winter time because of the drifting and the deep snow and the cold, and they go south to the south side of the Brooks Range. So um, as they went south, the wanderer followed in that direction as well. We know from his uh, movements, he was likely traveling alone. If he had a partner, he may have lost it. If he did, that was two potential mates he had lost in less than a year. Uh, we don't know if he had one or not. It was a long, difficult flight from Yukon Charlie Rivers National Preserve to that point in Alaska, so no one ever had a visual sighting of him. So we don't know whether he lost the mate or he'd been all alone the whole time. And as he went south, he entered the Ivishak drainage which is a grizzly bear habitat, some of the best grizzly bear habitat in the, in the Arctic. And he, they, those animals were competition for him for the ground squirrels that were still out of hibernation. Muskox rut was on, and now he was in great danger if he, if he approached muskox because these are very aggressive animals. They're very dangerous. Bulls have been seen attacking even birds that come into the proximity of the females they're interested in, and, the, and they're very dangerous. And so likely he had no chance to even get a muskox if he even found an injured one. So these are his last movements uh, before he headed south. You can see the movements in, in August and July. He made a 200-mile loop back the way he went and came back again. And he, this is the area it's centered in. Bruno Bay is up here. And he went south into the mountains and um, started south into the Brooks Range in late summer. And already the snow was coloring the peaks. And hopefully, uh, he could have found a doll sheep to feed upon. But winter was very close at hand. And the prey species like uh, Arctic ground squirrels that he had been feeding on for much of the summer disappeared because they hibernate for as much as seven months a year. And the only ones left above ground are the males, the females and young ones have already gone into hibernation. And so his prey base was shrinking as he went south. He couldn't get caribou anymore because for some unknown reason, he veered away from the path the migrating caribou took. He uh, had no longer the abundant ground squirrels and muskox were just out of reach. Another prey species that he could have found in the Brooks Range would be doll sheep. But that particular year, the population was beginning to crash and we saw no evidence from the location points that he had found or killed the doll sheep. At this time, he got on the south side of the Brooks Range. The caribou had migrated, and they were way over here on the Colleen, going towards the Colleen, and they were on the Chandelar River. 
And instead, he was going this direction south, away from the caribou. Again, why? It's hard to say. He entered the Jim River drainage. There are a few sheep at the head of the Jim River. And once again, for the first time since he left Yukon Charlie Rivers, he was in moose country. And I, I have often suspected that the scent of moose must have driven him wild because it was familiar prey to him. He knew how uh, much rich food would be there if he could get one. But as a lone wolf, he had no chance of getting one. Uh, his only chance was if he found some carrion or a, a moose injured during the rut, which had just concluded. <clears throat> and one of the most interesting things that occurred in this whole 3,000 mile epic was of all the places he could have gone, he could have gone east, he could have gone west, he went south, <clears throat> excuse me, and he ended up in an area called Hadzana Hills. And what's interesting about this is there's a thousand animal non-migratory caribou herd here that lives in these hills. So he couldn't have followed them. He couldn't have had the scent of them. He ended up right in the midst of this herd in the middle of the rut and how, we don't really know, but there he was. And these are his last movements in the Hudsana Hills. He wandered back and forth across the hills and there's a couple of places where he stayed more than a day, which indicated he had found carrion or found a winter killed, or I mean, uh, autumn killed caribou and had food. But then after five or six days, he headed south past Finger Mountain, major landmark. And this was his farthest south point. He was in the Fort Hamlin Hills, just 12 miles from the Yukon River. And what's really interesting about this, and one thing I've thought about a lot is he was barely 200 miles to the west of his home territory. Was he somehow headed home? And because of the lack of food and because of his weakening condition, because he hadn't been able to catch anything to eat, did that prevent him from returning to his natal territory? We'll always wonder. So he went back north, back into the Hudsana Hills. And one day after hanging out a couple more days, he descended to um, near Finger Mountain onto the Kanuti River. And he spent one night on the river, the closest he'd come to a road in the entire time he'd been traveling for those months. And the next day he staggered about 300 yards downstream and that was his final movement. Well, John Birch got the mortality signal, knew that the wolf had succumbed, succumbed and he was dead right here. The signal was coming from right here. He had been up here on the Hadzana Hills and the signal was there. And in one day, the weather went from that to this. And so as soon as they could, uh, one of John's assistant, assistants, Seth McMillan, uh, tracked in with the radio transmitter receiver and found the wanderer uh, curled up under a tree. He was totally intact. Uh, um, obviously, he, when uh, Seth lifted him up, he knew that he had starved to death because the 100 and plus pound wolf laid, weighed around 60 pounds or less. When, that, when the necropsy was done, they found that, yes, indeed, he had starved to death. And an, an amazing journey that ended in the way many journeys for wolves end. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, 
I'm just giving it a second because I feel really sorry for the wolf. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Hillary, I, I've uh, followed uh, wildlife for f almost all of my life. You know, in 50 years in Alaska, I've 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 watched animals through through so many different um, seasons and so many different events. But why I wanted to tell this story was just because you think of an animal that is following his biological imperative. He's trying to find his own mate. He's trying to find his own territory. He heads off into the great unknown, really, uh, a tabula rasa, and he travels that great a distance, the measured distance is around 2,100 miles. But if you've ever been around a dog um, or walked a dog off leash, you know that uh, they don't go from point A to point B. While you go to, from point A to point B, they've run circles around you and they've gone further and back. And the points we have on the satellite tracking devices only show where he was one morning and only shows where he was the next morning, and it might only be 50 miles uh, in a measurable distance, but you know he's gone a lot further. So there's a calculation that uh, the biologist did that, that indicated that uh, a suscept an acceptable number was he probably went 2,900 miles in that length of time. And through all of that wilderness, through uh, literally hundreds of thousands of caribou, tens of thousands of moose, thousands of sheep, uh, uh, ba black bears, grizzly bears, and the starved to death. The story is that for a predator in the wild, life is very, very difficult. It's very difficult to make a living out there. And if you think of an animal that lives by catching its dinner solely with its mouth, it's a phenomenal story. Yes, I agree with you. And I think what was coming to my mind when you were kind of talking about all of his travels through all of these areas was just how important this interconnection between all of wildlife is to everyone's survival and the importance of the land being able to support all kinds of life, because even with these big populations of animals, it's still possible for a wolf to starve to death out there. And it definitely made me feel inspired to try to keep these areas as healthy as possible so that they can just be bountiful with wildlife for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I probably won't get this verbatim, but there was a biologist in Alaska by the name of Bob Weed, and, and he once said that the world needs the embodiment of the frontier mythology, a place where wolves stalk the strand lines in the dark, because a place that can produce a wolf is a healthy, robust, and perfect land. I love that. Yeah, I wish I would have said it. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get to Q and A, I just wanted to um, introduce our director of development. I'm going to see if I can pull him up on the screen for a second because we were going to offer a free copy of your book to um, to our to one audience member, and he has that person. Um, let me just pull him up here. And he's just going to say a few words about how this connects with our work. So I'm going to get Chris up here and add you in a spotlight, Chris. There we go. OK. Hello. Hey, everyone. Free is always great. And thank you so much, Tom, um, for that incredible presentation. Um, uh, we've been looking at, I mean, as as employees of Alaska Wilderness League, we've been able to see all these incredible images, but you've been able to showcase some of the diversity of seasons, and certainly the the the, the landscape and and the journey was was very powerful. Um, I am excited to announce, and thank you, Hillary, for taking that up. That uh, Lynn Moreau uh, is the uh, recipient of the free copy of this book, 
um, The Wanderer, which I am very jealous about because I am looking forward to trying to get my hands on this. Um, I'll also share too, for folks who weren't uh, in, in Lynn's shoes, uh, there was a, uh, a discount code that was shared earlier and we will ensure that we, we share that for folks uh, who are on this and RSVP to this event so that you have an opportunity to get the, the copy in hand as well. Um, and, and otherwise, I do wanna thank everyone for being a part of this. This is, I think, the last episode of our um, Geography of Hope season. Um, we've been doing this now for a few years and we're thrilled to be able to highlight the, this story. Um, one of the things that shined through for me, and I don't know if this, I'll, we'll, I'll give it a little bit of time for Q&A, was, was the opportunity to showcase these vast landscapes. The amount of uh, open space that these animals need for thriving, and that is exactly why Alaska Wilderness League was formed, to preserve massive areas of land to allow for these wild areas to, to flourish. Um, this is why we're also invested in making sure that people support this work. And so while we all can't get a free copy of a book, it does cost this money to, to preserve these areas. And so we're hoping that people can, to, to can visit our website and please become members if you are not already to help support and sustain this work moving forward. It does take a lot of effort to, for our dedicated team to move this work forward. And we're very grateful for the many people who we see who are active supporters on this. Um, I'll drop a link in the, in, in, in the chat just for folks having, you'll obviously get it in uh, a follow-up email, but uh, other than that, I do want to thank again, Tom, and I'll, I'll toss it back to Hillary for any, any outstanding questions here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, so there are a few questions that have come up and I'm just going to pull back to some, one of the first ones. Um, it was interesting because when you were going through the wolf's journey, um, you didn't really, no one knew why he went where he went. And similarly, um, someone was asking, do we know why the, or how the caribou know where to go? How do they find their migration spots each year? And I'm curious if you encountered information about that in all of these studies that you've done. Well, with so caribou, what? it's, 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 you know, their pattern has been established over thousands of years. Like there, I think there, I can't remember what the current number is, but there's, uh, you know, a couple dozen different caribou herds in Alaska, maybe even uh, more. And they have specific territories that are theirs, uh, specific home ranges, let's call it that way. And and they move seasonally from one point to another in a big round. They go from the Arctic slope over into Canada, then they're in Canada, then they come up in the late fall back onto the south slope of the Brooks Range, and they overwinter there. Then they move back up north. They go on the north side and they come back down again. And those patterns have been established you want to use a, a, a phrase that many people are probably familiar with is imprinting. The calves learn those roots from their moms and from the migrations, and they know where they're going. And that was kind of the interesting thing about the this wolf as other dispersing wolves. I don't know that they know where they're going. Maybe he, you know, commonly, a dispersing wolf settles down within 45 or 50 miles of its home territory, its natal territory. Uh, and other wolves move as much as 400 or 800 miles. And why? What, what influences them? Uh, I don't think we really know. And why did he go as far as he, he did? Because probably he didn't find open territory with a mate. And one of the, one of the strongest uh, reasons, I think, for his movements, he was often, and this is just a surmise, he was often influenced by the presence of other wolves. For example, like when he was in Avavik, uh National Park in northern Yukon, he was in the middle of the, of the herd calving. It would, it would be like nirvana for a wolf. There's food everywhere. It would be perfect for him. All of, a, all of a sudden, he had made a couple of kills, which were obviously calves. All of a sudden, he took off and got out of there. The only reason why was the presence of other wolves that threatened him. 
that could be the only reason why he left. And in that particular area, because the caribou were cohering there, uh, other wolves from other areas were obviously there as well. Yeah, so the other wolves potentially was a huge factor in his movement then. A great threat to him. That was one of the startling things is it's, it's not a, an exaggeration at all to say he moved through the territories of hundreds of wolves and survived that. So tell us about how a wolf, can you talk a little bit more about how it becomes a lone wolf? Well, the uh, biologists have told me that at any one time, 10 to 20% of the population is lone wolves, are lone wolves. And that dispersal is a way they enrich their, their genetic pool and they move on and establish new territories. Um, if you remember, I showed you, and I forgot to say so at the appropriate time, but I showed you Phonograph Nelson's cabin and told you that it was at the mouth of the Nation River. Well, he lost his running mate, Wolf 227, on the Nation River uh, in the fall of, of winter of 2010. And, and there was some debate between the biologists whether she had starved to death or was she killed by a moose while they attempted to uh, bring down a moose for food? And then another biologist thought that the likelihood was because they were in the territory of the nation pack, she was a victim of the nation pack and he escaped. So he was alone in the territory that he had shared uh, with 227. And then he left on his own. Uh, you know, you could think, well, maybe he'll just hang around there and hope a female will come in and he can pair up with her. But at the age he was, the the again, the biological imperative is for him to go off to find his own mate in his own territory. So he abandoned his natal territory in Yukon Charlie Rivers and went north. Do all of the male wolves abandon their natal territories or do some stay? Not all of them, but the, the, the majority. I'm not clear myself on, at one time it was thought that most dispersers were females because oh. the breeding pair controls the breeding. And if a female gets to be breeding age, there was this imperative to, to breed and and have young. And so it was thought that that female would go off on her own, disperse. But I'm not sure that the, the current findings uh, would, would verify that. Do the wolf researchers know if there are like social events that create one wolf to be more likely to be a disperser or another? Like, is it at the bottom of the pack? Is it weaker, smaller, more seems playful? Be, like, yeah, it seems to be more age related. I, I'm not sure of that, but it seems to be they get to a certain age, certain maturity, and that seems to be the genesis. Okay. And one of our viewers wanted to know how old the wanderer was when he died. About three. Only three years old. Okay. Um. I'm not seeing any more questions. If, if I've missed your question, go ahead. You can pop it into the chat right now. I, there's a lot of thank yous and how much everyone loved the presentation. Um, oh, here, actually, here's one that someone asked. Um, they're wondering if there are other wolf studies that look anything like this study of the wanderer, or is it just completely unique in its what, experience? What? There, there, is, there is a wolf. Um, uh, there, there's a wolf study, of course, at Yellowstone, uh, and there was a wolf that they collared in that area, and it moved an incredible distance. I don't know. I don't remember how, but you know, uh, it, let's say an equal or lesser amount that the wanderer did. 
but it was back and forth over the same area. And what was unique about this one was all of the new terrain um, that he encircled and, and traversed. And a lot, you know, Denali has a great um, wolf study going on now, headed by Bridget Borg. And the she's identified wolves here that have traveled as much as uh, four and five hundred or more miles. So it's not uncommon that uh, they do go great distances. Okay. And I, I often think that with any of these studies, you know, we we are uh, amazed at what we find, but I don't think this is the first wolf that ever did that. It's the first one we know of. Yeah. And is the, is, was wolf, the wanderer wolf about an average age when he died or an average age when he left his pack? Like what, what, is, what is a typical age pattern for the wolves to leave and to Yeah, he was, at, he was at the, a, about what you would expect for a wolf to leave a uh, disperse. Um, and just so everyone knows, it's clear, an old wolf is eight years old. That's about their lifespan in the wild. An old wolf is about eight. Okay, well, I think that those are all of our questions tonight. Um, I'm so grateful to hearing the story about the wolf with you. This has been amazing and really, really appreciate the work you did to track his journey. Um, yeah, any last, I mean, I guess we often ask our Geography of Hope participants if they have a message of hope from the story that they shared. And maybe I'll close with that of just what, what feeling of hope does this wolf's story instill well, in you? I think everyone's aware of the, you know, the prejudice that wolves face and the difficulty well, there has been in reestablishing 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 them in places but my message of hope is that we'll always have wolves and we'll always have uh, uh bears as long as we have lots of wilderness and undeveloped uh, land for them to live in and i feel that in alaska and the yukon there have been great strides in protecting lands so that we have those uh, predators. And, and I, I feel fairly confident that barring some catastrophe unknown to unforeseeable that we're always gonna have wolves in Alaska and grizzly bears in Alaska and perhaps in numbers that would exceed expectation. Thank you. You know, it's so interesting that that is exactly the reason that I first was inspired to join Alaska Wilderness League and protect these places because I just feel like it's such a unique area for something that is so rare in other places of our country. And to everyone who's still with us tonight, thank you for being a part of this organization and supporting all of this work. It's thanks to everyone that we keep these lands open and wild and sustaining all of these wild creatures. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you for asking me. Bye. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Have a great end of your day.